Good afternoon. The first item of business today is portfolio questions. We start with environment, climate change and land reform. Question number one from James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what initiatives it plans to improve the environment in South Lanarkshire. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. The local authority, together with local partners, play the lead role in improving the environment in South Lanarkshire. At a national level, standards and support are provided through public bodies, such as the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency and Scottish Natural Heritage, as well as targeted initiatives such as the Central Scotland Green Network. The 2018-19 programme for government sets out a range of commitments to drive forward the Scottish Government's ambition for Scotland's environment and on climate change. And these include a commitment to develop an environment strategy to guide future activity across Scotland's existing environmental policies. James Kelly. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that South Lanarkshire Council has not currently declared a low emission zone. Uh, campaigning groups in Canvas Lang, including Canvas Lang Community Council, have highlighted the issue of emissions in Canvas Lang Main Street. Therefore, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if the Government would consider designating South Lanarkshire a low emission zone in order to help tackle the issues around emissions in Canvas Lang Main Street? Well, I think the member is aware that uh, the focus of the uh, uh, current uh, plans in terms of low emission zones are to progress low emission zones in the four uh, major cities in Scotland uh, and thereafter to begin to look at uh, those areas of Scotland uh, after that which may uh, indeed require low emission zones. And I hope if South Lanarkshire is thinking about it, and I don't know whether or not they are, uh, um, uh, that uh, they will come forward with some ideas well in advance of that process, but they will be able to learn from the process that is being gone through in respect of the four cities that we're talking about just now. Illuminating answer from the Minister there. Uh, Linda Fabiani. <laughs> the, lights, the lights came up in the Parliament. I don't know. <laughs> I'll put my hand up next time. If I'm <laughs> Linda uh, Fabiani. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Presiding Officer. Further to the Cabinet Secretary's response about low emission zones, uh, does she recognise um, that in order for cities to have successful low emission zones, notice must be taken of surrounding towns, commuter towns, satellite towns? And does she agree with me that it would be beneficial uh, for those heading up the initiatives in the city to open discussions with their surrounding towns such as with the East Kilbride Task Force in my constituency of East Kilbride. Cabinet Secretary. Um, uh, Presiding Officer, I'm beginning to get the feeling I might be stepping into a discussion or an argument which uh, I haven't hitherto been involved with, so I'm going to tread warily here uh, and suggest that groups uh, across Scotland who have a strong interest and concern in this should be flagging up their interest and concern uh, with all other areas as well, because it is the case, particularly in urban Scotland, uh, that the boundaries between local authorities uh, don't just simply cut off uh, in terms of issues like air quality. Uh, that may be different when it comes to more rural uh, local authorities where there's a huge hinterland, but I take the point that the member is making uh, about the need for there to be cross-boundary conversations, and I hope those are going ahead. Thank you. Question number two, Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the Scottish Coastal Rubbish Aerial Phot Photography Project. Minister Marie Goujon. Thank you. And I would thank Jenny Gilruth for that question because it's great to have the opportunity to actually say a little bit about this project. Because the Scottish Coastal Rubbish Aerial Photography Project, or Scrapbook, is an absolutely fantastic project which involves the work of volunteer pilots through Skywatch, capturing images of our coastline and highlighting where marine litter is collecting and really I trying to identify the often hard to reach areas where a lot of this litter can accumulate. And I had the opportunity to see that firsthand uh, over the summer when I went out on a slightly terrifying but also amazing uh, gyrocopter flight to examine this for myself uh, and examine the coastline around the Murray Firth. Now, all the images that the Skywatch pilots capture are collated on the Scrapbook website uh, at scrapbook.org.uk. And there they have an interactive map which members of the public can use. 
This pilot was funded by the Scottish Government early there, earlier this year and since then it's grown in size and success and now over 50% of Scotland's mainland coasts have now been mapped and more data is being added to the online interactive map every day. And that achievement is really credited to the organisers, Murray Firth Partnership, Marine Conservation Society and Skywatch and all the many uh, volunteers that support that project. Uh, visitors to the Scrapbook website can see the areas that are worst affected and then use that information to prioritise any beach cleanups. This information has been invaluable to local coastal partnerships, organisations and individuals tackling marine litter firsthand and I really applaud those efforts. And I will be meeting with Scrapbook on Friday while taking part in the Marine Conservation Society's 25th Great British Beach Clean and I would like to take this opportunity to urge others to do their bit for the environment and join in their local beach cleans this weekend. Jenny Gilruth. I thank the Minister for that response and I welcome her to her new role. While the Scrapbook project is undoubtedly helpful in identifying where coastal litter is collecting, what action is the Scottish Government taking to protect and promote our coastline, places like beautiful Leaven Beach in my constituency, which could benefit from investment? Minister. I mean, from my perspective as a Minister for the Natural Environment, uh, it's the natural environment that is exactly what I want to try and enhance and promote to people. And I believe that a massive part of that is trying to tackle the blight of litter on our coastlines. Um, because a large part of the, the litter that lands on our coast, even though it comes from the sea, the vast majority of that originates on land. And obviously there are a number of measures that the Scottish Government is taking to try and prevent the use of single-use plastics and to prevent those from entering our oceans and causing this, uh, this litter to accumulate in the first place. Um, and as part of that, I mean, I want to encourage as many people as possible to visit our incredible coastlines, such as what we have in Leaven, uh, where Jenny Goldruth has invited me to attend and where I will be visiting this Friday to take part in a beach clean there. Because I think by doing our bit there, by encouraging more people to get out and about and visit our incredible coastlines, yeah. that does a lot for tourism for, uh, and obviously has an, uh, an extra boost extra boost for the local economy too. Um, so I look forward to seeing Jenny Gilruth this Friday and again would encourage members to get out and about and do their bit for the environment too. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Minister will be aware of the many voluntary organisations such as the Friends of Troon Beaches, Ayrshire Rotary Clubs and others who organise litter picking off beaches in our area and elsewhere in Scotland. What support can the Scottish Government give to voluntary organisations such as the ones I have mentioned, as well as local authorities, to start addressing this problem? Minister. This is something that we're obviously very keen to support. I mean, another local organisation that I'm aware of is Surfers Against Sewage, who do a power of work in engaging with local communities and local schools to get everybody out and about. Because I do think this, is, this isn't one person's problem or entirely up to the government to solve or up to any individual in particular, because I think we all have a part to play in this and we all can do our bit, whether that's individually picking up pieces of litter that we find along the beach, uh, government leading through legislation, and support um, but I do think that this is something we all have a part to play in and I would actively uh, encourage and support all these groups and the, and the amazing work that they do and all the volunteer work that goes into this too and again encourage everybody to do their bit. Question number three, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the establishment of the deposit return scheme. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, Scotland was the first country in the UK to commit to introducing deposit return on drinks containers and we've been making good progress since it was announced. We're currently consulting on the range of options that will make up a successful scheme, building on the detailed analysis work previously done by Zero Waste Scotland. The consultation closes on 25th September 2018, after which the results will be analysed and published and I encourage people, if they haven't already done so, uh, to make their views heard. Uh, this year's programme for government commits us to bringing forward a final design based on the outcome of the consultation and our wider engagement. Clear answer. Thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary, for that answer. Um, is there any further information about how the pilot programmes are performing at the moment and how that will inform the final scheme that will be introduced in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, a number of organisations and businesses are currently piloting how reverse vending machines would operate in their shops. Um, while it's important to note that these schemes provide a reward 
rather than returning a deposit. We will view the results with interest alongside the various responses to our public consultation, which, as I've already indicated, closes uh, on the 25th of, uh, 25th of September. And I look forward to bringing the deposit return scheme to Parliament next year. Morris Golden. Clear and interest based on my work in the waste sector. Uh, however, how many jobs will be lost in local authority curbside collections as a result of the introduction of the deposit return scheme? Cabinet Secretary. Oh, I'm a little unclear from the member's question there whether or not he actually supports the deposit return scheme or is opposed to it. And I would be rather concerned if the, if the argument that he's going to make uh, is opposition. Um, a deposit return scheme in itself will create jobs. Uh, and I think that that needs to be kept in mind. I, I visited Norway over the summer to have specific conversations with them about their scheme. And it's quite clear that the economic opportunities that spin off from that are, are enormous uh, and they are there for the taking in Scotland. So I would hope that what this results in is a net increase in jobs rather than a net loss of jobs. James Kelly. The Cabinet Secretary referenced uh, widening engagement. I think that's vital because there's, there remains a misunderstanding as to what can be recycled and where it can be recycled. Uh, will, the man, will the Cabinet Secretary therefore look at a public information scheme uh, if the deposit return scheme is to be taken forward in order to raise public awareness of appropriate recycling? Um, I think that would be absolutely vital. Um, uh, there is uh, out there, I think, a general sense that deposit return scheme is good to have. Uh, people uh, want to see it happen. Uh, I think perhaps in its specifics, it's not as well understood as we might always uh, want. And there are issues uh, um, about individual items. The, the, the Scottish uh, scheme, I hope, is going to be as ambitious as it possibly can be. Um, but we have actually reached an enormous number of people uh, already in terms of the consultation. Um, we've had uh, a huge number uh, of responses already, um, uh, just over a thousand uh, uh, responses and the majority of those are actually from individuals uh, and Zero Waste Scotland is doing an incredibly good job of getting out there around communities and I would uh, say to all members here if they get the opportunity to join in one of the Zero Waste Scotland uh, roadshow style things that they are doing around Scotland they perhaps uh, should do that um, that process will help precisely the issue that uh, James Kelly is raising, but he's quite right that when we get to the process of actually introducing a scheme, there will have to then be a further process of uh, consultation and uh, uh, advice and education around that scheme. Question for Ian Gray. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it monitors and shares data on chemicals of environmental concern, particularly chemicals that are closely related to those already restricted. Cabinet Secretary. Um, this is quite a technical question, Presiding Officer, so I hope you will uh, bear with me. Um, the EU REACH regulation provides a mechanism for the registration, evaluation, authorisation and restriction of chemicals, and that's hence the acronym REACH, across EU member states and provides a formal process for identifying substances of concern. The regulation also establishes the European Chemicals Agency to oversee the EU chemicals regime and requires each member state to designate a member state competent authority to share information. As a GB-wide agency, the Health and Safety Executive hosts the UK's member state competent authority and acts as the delegated competent authority for REACH on behalf of the Secretary of State and all the devolved administrations supported in terms of environmental science by the Chemicals Assessment Unit, which sits within the Environment Agency based in England. And the, there are working arrangements in practice for collaboration between all of the relevant departments and regulators principally the Chemicals Delivery Board and the Envir Enforcement Liaison Group, both operated by HSE. Ian Gray. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. The question was prompted, though, by a concern that uh, even where chemicals of environmental concern, such as certain poly or perfluorinated alcohol substances covered by REACH are restricted by European legislation, sometimes substitute chemicals of very similar composition and similar concern uh, are still used, for example, uh, as uh, stain-resistant coatings uh, on school uniforms. Uh, the uh, environmental charity FIDRA, based in my constituency, uh, have highlighted their concerns that current legislation isn't able to tackle 
that substitution for chemicals of concern and uh, also uh, note that data regarding monitoring isn't readily accessible. So uh, what can the Scottish Government do more to ensure that environmental standards can't be bypassed in this way? Uh, and will the Minister commit to making the monitoring data available to her more publicly accessible? Um, well, I think I've outlined in my opening answer just the, the overall uh, way in which this is uh, dealt with in relation to monitoring and sharing data uh, on chemicals of environmental concern. If it became apparent that a new restriction on a substance may be appropriate, and I think that's probably the conversation that's currently being had, SEPA would provide details of this to HSE for submission to the ECHA on behalf of the UK. Um, and the process can work the other way. Um, the, the difficulty, I think, was some of the discussion that's taking place, not just about uh, uh, this particular uh, um, uh, stain-resistant uh, treatment that is being discussed, but some of the other issues that are beginning to arise uh, uh, out of environmental concerns are that there isn't as yet uh, uh, sufficient global research and understanding to know exactly what uh, uh, we might be able to do in respect of handling that. Um, but there is a process uh, once that uh, 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 monitoring uh, uh, and uh, 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 research uh, does take place. So um, I will take on board what the member has asked me about and I will endeavour to get more detailed information about the very specific issue that he's raised and come back to him with a conversation uh, around that. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. With reference to chemicals of environmental concern, will the Cabinet Secretary look into the SEPA guidance to local authorities on issuing planning consent to car washes and the disposal of their wastewater? As from my inquiries, I have concerns the guidance may not be sufficiently robust. Cabinet Secretary. Well, planning consent for either automatic or hand car washes is a matter for each local authority. Um, see, there is SEPA guidance on vehicle washing and cleaning, which provides systematic requirements for a number of activities, including drainage. The preferred option is that any new discharge from a car wash should discharge into the Scottish Water public foul sewer or be stored within a holding tank pending off-site disposal as liquid waste. Now, I'm not uh, aware of whether or not the member has a very specific uh, um, example or concern uh, in mind. Um, uh, but SEPA is not routinely consulted by the planning authority on proposals for new car washes. Uh, and uh, if there is, a, if there is a, a, an issue of specific concern that she uh, wants to raise, then I would be happy to have that conversation with her. Question number five, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Can I refer members to the voluntary part of my register of interest as a member of the League Against Cruel Sports to ask the Scottish Government by what date it will respond to the results of its consultation on improving the protection of wild animals? Minister Mary Gujo. Almost 20,000 people responded to our consultation on Lord Bonamy's recommendations and the analysis of those responses was published, published just before the summer recess. Now, at that point, I was appointed as Minister for Rural Affairs and the Natural Environment and since then, I've been actively considering all the issues and have met with a number of key organisations and individuals and I would hope to be in a position to announce the Scottish Government's response to that consultation soon. Colin Smith. Can I first of all uh, welcome Mary Gujon to her uh, new ministerial role? When, when Parliament voted for the Protection of Wild Mammals Act in 2002, it did so believing it would lead to a proper ban on hunting. Since then, some hunt hunts have gone out of their way to, to ignore the law, both in spirit and in practice, exposing unintended loopholes in that act. So does the minister therefore agree that if the government fails to bring forward proposals that implement a proper ban, including ending the loophole that allows mounted hunts to flush out foxes and reducing the number of dogs used in all exemptions to two, it would not only be ignoring the overwhelming views expressed in the responses to its own consultation, but it would undermine the very credibility of this parliament. Yes. Now, I, I'm well aware that this is an issue that Colin Smith has been very vocal and active on, as well as a number of other members across this chamber. And of course, it's an issue that a number of people feel very passionate about. And we can see that from the 20,000 responses that we received to that consultation. But the last thing that I want to do today is preempt what I come to, to Parliament with and what I eventually bring to Parliament. I, of course, if anybody has any evidence of illegal activity taking place at the moment, then I would urge them to contact uh, Police Scotland. But 
given the nature of this and the, the importance of it, I hope that the member understands that this is something that I take personally very seriously. I want to take the time to consider it properly before I come to Parliament with any recommendations. So I hope that he can understand that and I'll allow that process to take place. But I, I would hope to... Uh, I just want them to, to know that this is an issue that I intend to take the time to fully consider before I come back with any recommendations. I'll take question six if Mr Finney can keep his supplementary quite brief, but first the um, initial question. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to environmental protection concerns regarding proposals to mechanically harvest kelp by dredging. I'm aware of uh, current concerns in light of a proposal by a company seeking a marine licence to mechanically harvest kelp from multiple areas across the West Coast. While I understand the process is not dredging in the traditional sense, I can assure uh, the member that the Scottish Government takes the protection of its marine environment very seriously. We have one of the world's richest marine environments and we will continue to support clean, healthy, safe, productive and biologically diverse seas, balancing sustainable development with environmental protection as set out in Scotland's National Marine Plan. John Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, kelp beds are vital ecosystems. They absorb the power of the waves. They lock up millions of tonnes of carbon every year. And they provide shelter to many species, including harvested species. I hope you're fully aware of the concerns there are on the West Coast about dredging proposals. People are fully supportive of traditional harvesting methods, which were sustainable. What's very clear is dredging will seriously damage the entire ecosystem and is not sustainable. Will the Cabinet Secretary acknowledge how disastrous permitting dredging for kelp would be and put a stop to it now, please. Cabinet well, Secretary. I think the member knows that we're currently in a process. It's a very early in the process. The, uh, the company who has uh, an interest in this is uh, uh, presently undergoing a scoping exercise. And of course, I'm very well aware uh, of the very strong views there are on this. Uh, and all of this will be taken into account by Marine Scotland. Thank you. We'll move on now to questions on the rural economy. Question number one from Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To uh, ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to encourage a new generation of farmers into the agricultural industry. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewan. Uh, the Scottish Government have done a lot to encourage new entrants. Key initiatives, uh, Presiding Officer, have been first a specific start-up support, creating over 250 new businesses, most of whom are for young people. Uh, supporting another 600 business development projects from new entrants, delivering a farm advisory service, providing a network of new entrant groups across the country and offering a free mentoring program. Fourth, putting in place the farming opportunities for new entrants, the phone group, and finally, developing a partnership with Lantra and the Royal Highland Education Trust to help raise awareness and increase knowledge of farming in schools. Murdo Fraser. Can I thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for his response? He will, however, be aware of the dismay uh, amongst many farmers at the closure of the new entrance scheme uh, some two years early, causing particular concern to those who were in the process of submitting applications to this scheme. Can the uh, Cabinet Secretary tell us, will there be a replacement for this scheme? If so, when? And when will we hear the details? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we are very proud that the support for new entrants in Scotland has uh, seen the injection of 22 million into new businesses over the last four years and uh, has helped a, a huge number of, of young people in Scotland. I have to say that there is no such programme in England, none whatsoever. There's been no support in England whatsoever for new entrants. Uh, Presiding officer, we still support new entrants in Scotland in a number of ways. Through direct support through the National Reserve will continue. Farm advisory service remains ideally placed. Uh, an EU research, an independent EU re U research study, uh, stated that our phones initiative, that's public bodies making available land for new entrants, and there have been around about uh, 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 60 of those uh, made or to be made available as inspirational. So we are continuing to do more. But finally, in our stability and simplicity paper, presiding officer, we clearly state that this is an area where I hope that all parties will wish to do more post-Brexit, provided, of course, the funding is available. And given this morning's announcement in the Agricultural Bill, there is no guarantee about future funding levels for agriculture or rural Scotland or Britain uh, uh, whatsoever. Alistair Allen. 
Uh, President Officer, will the Cabinet Secretary consider any new measures in future crofting legislation which might limit speculation in croft tenancies, a trend which has had the effect of deterring many new entrants to crofting in some areas? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I'm aware of Dr Allen's close interest, uh, a constant interest in this important topic. And croft tenancies used to pass between family members. It's now true that tenancies are, uh, as the member indicates, sometimes sold by crofters with consequences for the availability of suitable crofts for new entrants. So I'm currently exploring what we might do in this regard to support more people to secure a croft. We'll consider what might be usefully included in the forthcoming crofting bill, presiding officer. I know uh, that, uh, that uh, Dr. Allen takes a close interest in all these matters and I'd be very happy to meet with him and indeed any other MSPs with an interest in crofting to discuss any specific proposal or ideas which members uh, may have uh, in order to assist new entrants in the crofting counties. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. With the average age of Scottish farmers at 58, attracting new entrants to farming is vital for the long-term sustainability of the industry. How is the Scottish Government making use of public land to attract people to farming, and how many farmers have benefited as a result? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, as part of our commitment to developing opportunities for new entrants, the chance was offered to nine new entrants to lease part-time starter units on Scotland's National Forest Estate. Uh, and indeed, we want to go further with that uh, in respect of uh, our National Forest Estate. The phone group Farming Opportunities for New Entrants is developing a new entrance programme uh, that includes maximising the amount of public land used to help farmers of the future. That could be the, uh, land owned by the Scottish Government, uh, by agencies of the Scottish Government, by local authorities, and indeed by non-departmental government bodies. To date, this has helped provide 59 59 new land opportunities across the National Forest Estate with 37 awarded new entrants. And Scottish Water, Highland and East Lothian Council bring a further four new opportunities uh, which either are finalised or are being progressed through marketing processes. So working together across, uh, across the board in the Scottish public realm, we are, I think, uh, achieving considerable things, but we want to do much more, and I hope that if we can get the funding and the powers secured in any Brexit deal, we will be able to do more still. Question number two, Rona Mackay. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met the UK Government to discuss the impact of Brexit on farming and food production in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding officer, I met the Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs to discuss these matters on the 5th of July, along with the Welsh Cabinet Secretary for Environment and Rural Affairs and the Permanent Secretary of the Northern Ireland Executive. I also spoke with the Secretary of State, Mr Gove, last week to discuss the UK Agriculture Bill. Bruna Mackay. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the UK Agriculture Bill. Um, can uh, the Cabinet Secretary assure us that he has had appropriate input to that bill and that its provisions do not attempt to grab powers over farming and food production that rightly sit with this Parliament? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I wish I could, but I cannot provide these reassurances. I have repeatedly asked for discussion on the bill at the regular ministerial meetings between DEFRA and the devolved uh, administration, but there has been zero discussion on the content, merely on its timetable. I acknowledge that there have rightly been many hours of discussion at official level, but we didn't see the full version of the bill until the very end of August. I'm sure Parliament will share my concern at this, presiding officer, and what it may mean for other important Brexit-related bills. Uh, so, far from allaying concerns about a power grab by the UK government, I think this bill makes them worse. And in a number of areas, DEFRA are making the outrageous assertion that various areas are, of law are reserved uh, when our position is that that's plainly not the case. And this could therefore result in serious constraints on Scotland's future choice of policies and schemes. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Well, I welcome the fact that the Scottish Government recently consulted on support for agriculture and, and the rural economy um, during the, the Brexit transitionary period. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us when the Scottish Government will set out in detail the long-term vision for agricultural support after Brexit, which the industry is desperate to hear? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I thank Mr Smith for his recognition of uh, the fact that we have brought forward very serious proposals in our paper, Stability and Simplicity. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that is a, a consultation to which there has been a substantial response. Obviously, we will need to study carefully that response, and my intention is to report back 
to Parliament in due course. We are also expecting very shortly the report from the National Council of Rural Advisors. And equally, I've undertaken, I think, previously, presiding officer, that it's correct that I should make uh, a report at some stage to Parliament on these matters. Obviously, I wish to do all of that sooner rather than later. But, you know, I'm bound to say that here today we're debating this on the very morning when the National Audit Office of all bodies, the official audit office of the UK, has highlighted several respects in which a no-deal uh, Brexit could cause absolute mayhem in respect of insignificant, in respect of the lack of vets able to carry out inspections in respect of the lack uh, of uh, ability to deal with checks other than on a manual basis in respect of the chemical industry. Um, these are very serious matters indeed, uh, presiding officer, uh, and we are really uh, hoping that the Brexit Burich can be sorted out sooner rather than later. Question number three, Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding maintaining Scotland's protected food names and geographical indications following Brexit. Cabinet Secretary. A, a geographical indications are vital to our food and drink sector in Scotland with, uh, with £1,370 million pounds of whisky and £282 million pounds of salmon sold to Europe uh, last year alone, and this needs to be protected. The UK White Paper in July confirmed the UK government will be establishing its own GI scheme after exit, but there are no details. The UK government has failed to agree to the proposals in the draft withdraw withdrawal agreement for continued protection of European GIs in the UK. Uh, the UK government seemed to wish to use this as a bargaining chip, assuming that the EU will continue to protect UK GIs even if we do not reciprocate. This, presiding officer, is no time to play games with the interests of our key businesses because PGIs are absolutely essential for a whole range of high quality Scottish food and drink produce. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that information, which ties in with the report that uh, Michel Barnier has said that the UK government has not yet agreed to protect these geographical indications. I, I'm really concerned about this, um, given that Scottish food and drink exports are at an all-time high. This is not a time to be compromising the provenance of Scottish food and drink. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that every effort must now be made by the UK government to ensure that Scotland is protected in this regard and open full discussions with the UK government, sorry, with the Scottish government about how we move forward on this? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I, I agree that, uh, that it's extremely alarming that uh, the EU says this has not been resolved. I mean, in terms of the scheme of things, this, this is not something that's complex to, to resolve. This is something that should surely have been resolved. The reciprocal recognition of GIs, which have been hard-earned in respect of our beef, lamb, salmon, our roast smokies, and in Europe in respect of the champagne, many other products that have GIs. I mean, how complicated is it to resolve? The fact that it hasn't really, I think, does uh, illustrate just how powerless the Brexit Burek has become. So uh, I am meeting with uh, Mr. Gove on Monday of next week, and I most certainly shall be pressing home this matter, which Linda Fabiani has rightly raised, and which is essential for the continuing success of our food and drink sector. David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be well aware that GIs are vitally important in the Highlands and Islands. For example, Stornoway Black Pudding has been protected by GIs, and I'd like to thank my colleague Rhoda Grant for her great campaign. Can I say uh, to the Cabinet Secretary that I've undergone extensive market testing of Stornoway Black Pudding. It's a first-class product with no adverse effect on my waistline. Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I'm, I'm perfectly prepared to accept that proposition from Mr. Stewart. And I assume, like me, he's also consumed some of the excellent black, black pudding that can be purchased uh, from the butchers in, in Stornoway, uh, a, something that I must admit I myself have, have done. So I think we have a joint, shared, passionate, uh, detailed, prolonged, protracted interest <laughs> in the continuing success of Stornoway black pudding. Uh, 
and let's be kind of ecumenical about this, Cornish pasties as well. I mean, across the UK, there's a whole series of uh, food produce mm -hmm. that has gained these GIs because of their niche value. Mm -hmm. And that helps uh, them get the market, it helps them export, it helps them get a premium price, all of these things. So I think David Stewart makes a very good point, and I'm very happy to join him in the crusade and continuing campaign for the continuing worldwide success of Stornoway Black Pudding. Question number four, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to help small food retailers and convenience stores to provide healthy food options to local communities. Minister Mary Goujon. The Scottish Government has provided £250,000 worth of funding to the Scottish Grocers Federation this year to help support small independent grocers to introduce food-to-go stations within their stores. Now that fund grants up to £75,000 to individual retailers to help them innovate and respond to changing customer demands through the development of a food-to-go offering uh, with a focus on fresh and healthy produce. Now, so far, there have been 62 successful applicants to the fund, of which eight of those independent grocers are from the members' Kirkcaldy constituency. David Torrance. I welcome this fund and awards to local businesses in my constituency. One of the issues small retailers face is being able to stay competitive. Does the minister agree with me that the biggest threat to small shops and customers is a hard Brexit resulting in huge food price increases? Yes, sir. Uh, I would thank the, the member for that question because David Torrance is absolutely right to raise concerns about the impact of Brexit on uh, small grocery and convenience stores because there could potentially be a number of harmful impacts that, to be honest, we just don't actually know about yet and an awful lot of, of unknown, unknown knowns, unknown unknowns. Now, there are several bodies such as the British Retail Consortium and the Institute of Fiscal Studies who have predicted that if we are to go through a hard Brexit, that could see a rise in food prices of around 22%. And David Thompson, the Chief Executive of Food and Drink Federation Scotland, had also recently warned that, again, if we see a no-deal Brexit, that would lead to a rise in food prices and also a reduction in the choices that we see available in our stores at the moment. Moment. So if we end up facing a hard Brexit and we don't get a deal, there is no doubt that that would be extremely damaging, not just to consumers, but also to the small independent convenience stores that we have at the moment, uh, who are already uh, operating in a highly competitive trading environment. Lewis MacDonald. You will know that the local government also has a role in promoting healthy options and she will know, I'm sure, about the innovative schemes put in place this summer by Aberdeen City Council and North Lanarkshire Council to provide nutritious meals uh, to school children out with term time. Does the Minister agree that this also is something worthy of government support in that it supports both producers and consumers of healthy food options? Minister. Uh, thank you. I'm sure that this is something that the local government minister would take an interest in as well. But I, I mean, I welcome all of these initiatives. And I'm, that's a large part of what our, our food and drink strategy is about. It's encouraging local produce and how we uh, were able to access that locally. So I think that uh, it's only right that we look at where this is happening and look at what we can do uh, as a government. I mean, that, as I say, that is something that we're, we're keen to support and look at and see where we can encourage uh, and promote getting that local produce uh, into our local communities and into places such as our, our local schools. Question number five, Angus MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to help farmers and crofters cope with the impact of adverse weather. Cabinet Secretary. The prolonged dry period compounded problems for farmers and crofters already coping with the wet weather of 2017 and subsequent late spring. Dry weather limited uh, grass growth for making silage uh, or livestock grazing purposes. So farmers and crofters have had to use up feed and fodder stocks intended for winter. And in other cases, uh, some farmers it's reported have had no choice but to sell on their livestock early. Um, therefore, working with the Agriculture, Agricultural Weather Advisory Panel, we've done the following. We've sought a derogation from greening crop diversification in spring this year as farmers struggle to plant crops due to the poor weather, we're supporting a pilot run by SAOS to help farmers and crofters cooperate to take advantage of available grazing opportunities. And crucially, we are introducing a national basic payment loan scheme to provide access to much needed funding to businesses facing these additional costs and cash flow shortages. Angus MacDonald. 
I thank the Minister for his reply and very much welcome the, the action taken to date. However, it's clear that some farmers and crofters will be struggling to meet obligations to satisfy greening rules under CAP. What temporary help might be available from the European Commission for farmers in this situation as a result of the adverse weather impacts? Cabinet Secretary. Hey, Mr Macdonald is absolutely correct and I'm very pleased to announce to the Chamber that the European Commission has accepted my request to increase the level of flexibility for Scottish farmers under greening rules regarding the use of catch and cover crops. And this additional flexibility can allow farmers to continue to meet the greening obligations whilst increasing the availability of fodder in what has been an extremely testing year. Thank you very much to ministers and members. That concludes portfolio questions.